This page of your notes is about gas gangrene. So let's go ahead and write Clostridium perfringens up here at the top. And Clostridium perfringens, again, like these other Clostridium we've been talking about, of course then is gram-positive rods. And these gram-positive rods can basically be found everywhere. So this bacteria is common everywhere. What that means is most of the time it's not making us sick. But in immunocompromised individuals, or if there's a very high infectious dose of the bacteria, then we can start to see the toxins cause disease. So the toxins, the most famous one is uh, called an alpha toxin, but these toxins can get into the skeletal muscle, uh, let's say uh, in a trauma wound that is left uncleaned, and the toxins will break down the muscle tissue and bubbles will start to form in the muscles. So the toxin can damage muscles and cause um, gas gangrene. So the tissue is rotting and bubbles are forming from the metabolic byproducts of the bacterial growth. So gas gangrene is one of the problems. This can lead to um, septic shock, may lead. In the old days, this was called blood poisoning. And so it was a well-known concern of a traumatic injury that in the days following that the person might, um, if they didn't have the limb amputated, that they could die of blood poisoning. During the U.S. Civil War, um, this was a problem for many um, battle wounds, and so there were many amputations that were done to try and um, prevent this from happening. Okay, so what these exotoxins can also do is dissolve the connective tissue so they can move through the tissue. And if that spread does reach the blood, that's where blood poisoning could develop. So when I say connective tissue, I usually mean like collagen fibers. Sorry, that's a little cramped, isn't it? So the exotoxins also can have an effect um, to cause food poisoning. So Clostridium perfringens is actually a fairly well-known cause of food poisoning, just like Clostridium botulinum but it doesn't make a neurotoxin, so it doesn't cause the paralysis of Clostridium botulinum. If you'd like to know more about that one, I did um, just make a video on Clostridium botulinum and how that has effects at the synapse um, and definitely can cause food poisoning. But now we're talking about a different type of Clostridium also can form food poisoning. So here would be the intestinal cells. And what happens is that the Toxin can damage the intestinal cells and cause really bad food poisoning. Oh, I'm going to use glue here. So food poisoning. Mostly in the small intestine, I think, is where this is the worst, um, the, where the worst effects are seen. So I also wanted to add about this, that because this toxin can damage these cells and because it can spread, then in a very bad case, the, the bacteria could actually move through the intestinal cells. And um, so once the bacteria are growing as well, then they could actually move through the intestinal cells and get to the bloodstream and then once again, we would be at risk of um, septic shock. 
Okay, so just to back up for a second and um, look at these different topics, they're all about um, the genre Clostridium, gram-positive endospore formers. They all are significant pathogens and are um, in a clinical environment. They are all obligate anaerobes, meaning that they thrive in an oxygen-free environment. And they're all very common around us. So what's interesting is to wonder what are the parameters that make someone get one of these infections because we're all encountering Clostridium every single day. So Clostridium tetani uh, is most commonly introduced into a deep puncture wound. Again, we're looking for that low oxygen environment. Clostridium botulinum is most commonly um, in co going to cause infection if the endospores are present in an improperly canned food. There's probably other cases too, but that's what I have read about the most. Um, Clostridium difficile is most commonly going to cause diarrhea diseases after antibiotics because um, the normal flora has been wiped out and then the endospores if they are introduced from let's say um, a hospital bed or or a hand of a patient then or a hand of a healthcare worker to the patient then the endospores can come in and start this massive damage that we can see with C. diff and then lastly uh, clostridium perfringens uh, can is well known for causing gas gangrene when the when the um, bacteria or its toxins are able to reach the skeletal muscle and when uh, the endospores are able to uh, germinate in the intestine and lead to food poisoning when the toxins start being released. I wanted to go back and mention one more thing. Um, we do have a good vaccine to Clostridium tetani, and the vaccine contains part of the neurotoxin. And so our bodies are best able to make antibodies to proteins. So maybe that's why this is a, a fairly effective vaccine. Uh, you would think we could make a vaccine for botulinum the same way. And I have had some of my students tell me that um, military uh, personnel are sometimes given a vaccine for Clostridium botulinum. It's probably very expensive to produce, so they might only give it to people that are at high risk, um, going into environments where they might be more exposed. And then I also wanted to highlight that um, Botox is an actual injection of the actual toxin into the facial muscles to reduce wrinkles. Now the bacteria itself, the vegetative cell, is not being introduced, so the toxin is only going to have its effect for maybe a few weeks or a few months, um, and then as long as it's not able to get any farther than those muscle cells, it wouldn't cause any far-reaching damage. We hope, anyway. Um, Okay, thank you.